Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, welcome to this Tax Policy Center event, Taxing Business Income, Evidence from the Survey of Consumer Finances. I am uh, doing the honors of uh, the opening remarks. Bill, Bill is having a little bit of trouble with his internet. Uh, Bill is the co-director of the Tax Policy Center and pulled all this together. Um, TPC is, of course, a joint venture of the Urban Institute and Brookings Institution uh, and studies a variety of aspects in tax policy and research. Uh, Bill asked that I pointed out that TaxVox, which is the blog for TPC, uh, is a great, I, I myself, I subscribe to it. It's a wonderful thing to, uh, to get your, your tax information from. Uh, Bill encourages you to sign up. And today's focus is going to be on the taxation of business income. So a quick overview of what we're going to be talking about. If you start with an economic measure of income generated by closely held business, the fraction that shows up on tax forms is small and, and falling over time. So we're interested in some big picture questions, um, like how big is the gap between economic income and the income that's reported on tax forms? Where in the income distribution is that divergence occurring? And what are the revenue implications of those differences? And the findings fall at the intersection of several issues, the distribution of income and wealth, tax fairness, business tax reform, and tax evasion. evasion. So that's mostly what I'm going to talk about uh, when, I, when I pick up with the presentation in a few minutes. But first, a couple of housekeeping issues, and, uh, and I want to introduce the other speakers for today. So first of all, we want to thank the Peter G. Peterson Foundation for generous financial support. We literally could not have done this project without that support. Um, they they uh, put a lot of faith in us with, when we came to them with the ideas uh, a year ago, uh, and uh, and I think it's I think it's um, it's borne out. Uh, we also really want to thank Megan Waring and the AB team at Brookings for pulling all this together and making it so our jobs are uh, easy. It's going to run smoothly. Um, and they've been doing this for almost two years now. So uh, I also want to point out after the uh, presentation and then discuss in comments, we'll have a Q&A session. And you can submit questions via email to events at brookings.edu and via Twitter with hashtag taxing income. So um, the, uh, the next thing on the agenda is speaker introductions. My name is John Sablehouse. I am uh, currently a non-resident senior fellow at Brookings Institution in Washington, D.C. Uh, I had a long stint at the Congressional Budget Office where I uh, studied Social Security and Medicare, uh, built a, uh, an integrated micro-macro model. Another long stint at the Federal Reserve Board where I uh, became, I, was, uh, I worked in the Division of Research and Statistics on the Survey of Consumer Finances. And obviously that's where my, my interest in today's topic comes from and using the, the SCF to study, study taxes. Um, the first discussion is Janet Holtzblatt, um, a colleague of Bill's at the Tax Policy Center. She serves as a senior fellow at the Urban Institute. For many years, she was the assistant director for individual taxation uh, division at the U.S. Treasury Office of Tax Analysis, and she was the unit chief for tax policy studies in the tax analysis division at the Congressional Budget Office. Uh, Janet was the recipient of the 2020 Davy Davis Public Service Award bestowed annually by the National Tax Association. Even among tax experts, she is the go-to person on a wide variety of issues involving the tax treatment of family and workers, the marriage penalty, tax administration evasion, and tax simplification. Uh, she wrote a paper 25 years ago on tax simplification. And I, I can add to, uh, to Bill's comments that uh, a lot of my interaction with, the, uh, with Janet over the past few years has been about SCF and, and think about how to use SCF uh, in the tax modeling work at TPC. Our second discussion is, uh, is a former colleague of mine and, and an uh, ongoing co-author of mine on a number of projects, Alice henriquez Volts. She is a principal uh, economist at the Federal Reserve Board. At the board, Alice works in the microsurvey section, uh, which oversees the survey of consumer finances. Her research interests generally focus on inequality and retirement. Um, Alice also has the great distinction of having served as a research assistant at the Brookings Institution. So as Bill points out, you'll know what she says is right. So with that, um, Bill has, uh, that, that's the end of Bill's, uh, Bill's remarks. So what I'm gonna do is go ahead and jump into the presentation uh, and then we'll just segue uh, uh, directly into Janet. And after that, we'll follow with Alice. So I am going to start with a screen share. 
Now let's get the right screen and share. And it looks like I am good to go. So let me go ahead and uh, start with the presentation. Then I'll, I'll time myself, make sure I stay on time. So uh, the title for the presentation is Taxing Business Incomes. Uh, again, we want to thank uh, Peterson for gener uh, generous financial support. In addition to Bill as a co-author, we have two wonderful uh, uh, younger co-authors, uh, Chris Pulliam, who's been at Brookings for a few years and is headed off to grad school next year, Swati Josie, who joined us last year uh, on this project and immediately became uh, a pivotal, uh, crucial part of pulling the data together. So we start this project with two motivating questions. First is, what is the share of closely held business and financial incomes that is effectively subject to the income tax? And as I pointed out, um, SOI business incomes, we, it's well known, uh, are only about half of what we see in the NIPA aggregates. But I guess the other way to think about why we're doing this, why we're approaching this the way we are, is that most tax research is done with just tax data. Tax data alone, however, is incomplete. We really want something that's more of an economic measure, something that gets closer to what we think uh, true income is, because tax data uh, already has baked in some of what some of the things that uh, we're concerned about that are driving a wedge between taxable and economic income. The second question is where in the income and wealth distribution is this missing uh, business and financial income? So evasion and conceptual differences are already baked in to the tax data. And the question is, can we measure something that's closer to a true concept of business income at the household level? And this is where our data set, the Survey of Consumer Finances comes in. There's also another reason for thinking about the distribution or another aspect to the distributional uh, concerns that we're gonna raise. Many low AGI taxpayers are actually very high wealth. Uh, this is sort of, I think, commonly known uh, to some people, rich people, very wealthy people have very low income and pay very, no, uh, pay very little tax. So having a data set, being able to do distributional analysis where we're looking at something that's about income, but we're tabulating, we're distributing uh, in a data set that also has very comprehensive measures of wealth is a great advantage. So, uh, so that leads us into the survey of consumer finances. The survey has comprehensive incomes and wealth. Uh, we'll show you that the SCF business incomes are much closer to the, to the national income and product account, the NIPA values, than they are to the tax reported values, the statistics of income values. And these differences seem mostly to be about business losses. It's not other types of income. Uh, it's, really about, it's really about whether or not there are losses. The gross values, as we'll show you, uh, tend to line up better. Um, there are two things you could do with the SCF. And as I mentioned, I've had interaction with Janet and others at TPC over the years uh, where they're trying to bring SCF wealth data into an ex their existing uh, uh, really uh, large scale uh, TPC tax model. That's one approach, one thing you can do. Um, one of the problems is that the SCF frame, right, the, the, the sample itself, the survey itself is household, it's not tax units. So the, the most of the work that, uh, that went into uh, to this grant that Peterson funded was about building a new tool. Uh, and that new tool, which we just give the name SCF plus tax sim, uh, is, is a tax calculator, uh, which we have benchmarked against published SOI data. So you may or may not know of tax sim. Anybody in the survey data world has, has almost certainly heard of tax sim. Uh, it is the NBR um, uh, model that you can use to apply to a survey data set and it will calculate tax liabilities for you. So the, so the basic gist of this is trying to get the SCF in a position where it can be, uh, where it can be run through the tax sim uh, calculator and generate results. So our goals, we have three goals for today's presentation. The first is we're gonna compare the aggregate taxable and economic income measures and, and reinforce this point about low and declining taxation of business and financial income. Second thing we're going to do is describe in very, very high level detail the methods for building this SCF plus tax sim tax model and how we calibrate it to published tax data. Uh, and then the third thing, we're going to do a thought experiment. We're going to simulate an alternative tax regime and we're going to ask the question, uh, assuming that there is uh, useful information in the SCF business incomes, which we think there is, how would taxes relative to wealth change if we could tax those business incomes differently. 
So with that, I'll launch into the first part. How much business income is effectively taxed? Uh, what we're going to do is compare the published SOI tax values to aggregate economic measures. So the SOI uh, very nicely provides uh, uh, many, many, I would probably say at this point, it's hundreds of Excel files uh, with tabulated tax data. And we chose a few series of these over time uh, that have the incomes in the categories that we need. For this exercise, we're collapsing these SOI categories down to a very highly aggregated category. Uh, uh, and hopefully comparable closely held business, it includes things like rental income as well, uh, category. We're also gonna add in for the first part, all other financial related financial incomes, uh, because in some ways some work has showed us, uh, recent work with tax data showed us that the connection, the distinction between different types of uh, financial incomes uh, is sometimes nebulous. Uh, and then we're gonna put uh, the rest of the incomes, the rest of the incomes that are, um, taxable for tax purposes uh, and in all other category. And what we're going to do is, uh, again, I mentioned we're going to connect, uh, consider the business related incomes together because they are connected flows, and then we'll look at business separately. We're also going to adjust the flows for tax-based exclusions and rate preferences. And, the, and our basis for doing this, I'll show you when we get there, is to make it so that we can think about different types of income being treated equivalently. Uh, in particular, if we have a preference for business income, whatever the economic justification for that is, uh, we can debate that separately. But what we're going to show you today is how that dollar of income would be treated if it were, for example, a dollar of wages. Uh, that's in order to, again, compare the economic measure to the tax measure. So this first line makes the point about um, how much of this business and financial income is taxed or in included in the tax base relative to our NIPA benchmark. And basically, the sum of published SOI, closely held business, dividend, and interest incomes uh, is less than 50% of the NIPA equivalent and it's declining over time. Depending on what your reference point is, you can think about how much it's declining. But uh, as you stare at this graph, we'll, we'll bring in another line and, and reinforce the second point that I made, that this, the solid line in the chart now answers the question, how would a dollar of business and financial income be treated if it were wages or some other normal income at any point in the income distribution. We're not trying to figure out marginal tax rates that are applied to different types of income or anything like that. This is just the aggregate amount of income. And so for example, if we exclude 50% uh, of dividends uh, from the tax base, which we did beginning in 2003, then the amount of financial income subject to tax falls by 50% of dividends. Uh, and thus the solid green line is below the dotted green line, which doesn't make that adjustment. There's also a very sharp drop in the end of our time period in 2018. That's the last year for which we have tax data and SCF data. Uh, and that's associated with the, with the QBI, the Qualified Business Income uh, Deduction. Uh, as I said, other types of income, we can lump all this together, and now you have to draw, you have to move your, your attention over to the right axis. And what we see is that all other taxable incomes, this is wages, social security, pensions, uh, other things, unemployment insurance, it's basically close to 90% of NIPA and declining modestly, and even that's mostly in the last few years. So what this shows us is that other types of income are much more effectively taxed under the income tax than business and financial income. So that's our first main takeaway from this, doing this careful reconciliation uh, against the NIPA, trying to get the concepts lined up, all of this is in the paper. Uh, we see that the share of income, business and financial income subject to tax is low and declining. The second thing we wanna talk about is the role of business losses. The usual focus of SOI versus NIPA is, uh, is generally we think of it as compliance. Somehow businesses are non-compliant in their reporting of revenues or, or perhaps costs, things like that. Uh, and that might be part of what's driving this very large gap. And, and certainly that's true. Uh, there, there is uh, some evidence based on compliance studies and there's a great ongoing debate uh, regarding the distributional implications uh, from, these, from these studies. But in aggregate, non-compliance seems to only be a part of the story. And how much of the story is something we're trying to get our own heads around. But at one point, I think we were thinking numbers like 20 or 25% of the gap. There's something much bigger. There's something bigger uh, in this gap between uh, SOI and NIPA. And one of the things that, that, that 
we wanted to, to look at, because the SOI data allows us to do this, is the role of positive and negative incomes uh, within each of these business income types. So again, these downloadable uh, SOI Excel files allow you to separate out the positives and the negatives. And, and we ask, what can we learn from comparing these positive and negative components? Uh, and again, looking at, and looking ahead to the SCF, when we go to compare the SCF, to published SOI, where we're doing this benchmarking exercise with our new tax model, losses are a big part of this gap. So, uh, so this is the, the business only part of the line that I showed you before. And here the numbers are a little bit higher. Business income by itself is about 50% 50, 50 of, um, of what's in the NIPA. Uh, but it's still, it's, it's more cyclical and there's a little bit less of a decline, but again, except for the, the QBI at the end. Um, the red line here is the amount of losses that we see in, in the SOI divided by the net NIPA aggregate. We don't have any concepts of, of losses in, uh, and gross positives in, in the NIPA, so we have to compare to the net. So obviously this is apples to oranges, but, but what jumps out at us is the fact that business losses are so large relative to the net, 30%. There is a cyclical you know, aspect or apparently cyclical aspect associated with the financial crisis, but this is mostly the drop in NIPA business incomes. It's not that there was a, a big surge in SOI business incomes. And what we see is sort of a strong upward trend, especially since 2000 in the relative magnitude of business losses. It's becoming more and more prevalent in the tax data that businesses are offsetting the positives with negatives. And this comes through if we look at the gross business income line. So again, this is relative to the NIPA net, so it's still apples to oranges. Um, but what we see is the same, uh, uh, we see something where the, there's not as much of a trend um, and uh, we see the same cyclical phenomenon, but it really draws our attention to business losses as something when we look ahead on our to-do list and think about things we wanna focus on, trying to reconcile what's happening in the NIPA versus SOI, uh, the losses really does capture our attention. Uh, there's a section in the paper, I'm gonna go through this pretty quickly because it, it, it gets in the weeds uh, very fast, but I, I will uh, refer you to the paper. The one uh, thing that tax economists may look at and say, well, if you're trying to compare NIPA data to SOI data, NIPA does not include capital gains. NIPA is payments to factors of production. Nothing I've showed you so far from the SOI has capital gains in it. And in principle, this is an important omission because these business losses and the capital gains are in principle related. In particular, losses often reflect the declining basis on an appreciating asset. You buy a building, you depreciate it, the losses on that building offset some other types of income. That's the usual model we have in mind. Um, and the accounting loss, however, will show back up in the tax base when that appreciating asset is sold. And what it suggests is that you could have an alternative measure of how much income is, is captured by the tax system. Uh, you would wanna add realized capital gains to the numerator, and then some measure of accrued capital gains to the denominator. Uh, so the realized gains, we could take this again from the same SOI tables. Um, and uh, the NIPA gains, it gets a lot more complicated. There's two ways to do it. One could use uh, the value of corporate profits uh, from another NIPA table, not in the personal income table, but the national income table. Um, or you can use a direct measure of accrued gains in the financial accounts of the United States, which I've used in, in several other projects. Uh, I will say that the, uh, the, the corporate profits, which is what people in the DINA literature, the distributional national accounts literature use, um, is about one fourth over this time period of um, the, uh, it's about one fourth of the gains of the corporate profits that we see, I'm sorry, the corporate profits are about one fourth of what we see in the financial accounts. So clearly there's a lot more happening in the financial accounts in terms of, uh, in terms of financial capital gains. Uh, there's also issues about what time period to average over the recent gains. If we're trying to capture this, what should be realized, what is being realized. Um, the, the FA is almost certainly a better measure of gains, but it's also more volatile. So this leads to a number of permutations, different ways of thinking about it, but none of them reverse this low and declining share of business be income being taxed phenomenon. Um, that is something that seems to be uh, pervasive. So this... These sort of observations from the macro data, everything so far has been macro data uh, or published tabulations of micro data from, uh, from the IRS. 
um, led us to approach uh, Peterson and say, we need uh, to bring a new tool to bear to look at these questions. And this led us to develop the survey of consumer, consumer finances plus tax and tax model. So the, the question, why would, you, why would you spend a year building a new tax model? And, uh, and uh, again, going back to where we started, the conceptual and compliance differences are baked into the tax data. You can't in make inferences about, about the economic uh, values just by looking at the tax data. The second reason is that taxable income itself is a very poor classifier variable. If we're trying to think about where is the missing income and you say, oh, this business really had a hundred million dollars or had a million dollars of income, but that is added to someone who, who has a tax reported value of minus a hundred, uh, then basically it's showing up in the wrong part of the distribution. We know that these are wealthy families uh, and just looking at tax data doesn't allow us to, to capture that. So there are pluses and minuses of using the SCF. Everyone who's worked with the data, I think, knows this. The main advantage is the oversampling of high wealth families and the work I've done with Alice and others. I think we've showed that uh, the SCF does capture trends in wealth concentration. It's useful for uh, studying in inequality very generally. The, um, uh, it can be argued that uh, the main disadvantage is small sample size and, and, and using respondent reports instead of tax data is introduces a new source of error. And that's almost certainly true. Recall can be a problem. Um, but several studies by uh, people who I worked with the board and others has showed very close correspondence between SCF and macro aggregates, trends over time and also in business cycle frequencies. And indeed, the biggest difference that one sees is in the business incomes. And you might say, well, that's respondent reporting error. But is it? And that's the that's the question that 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 propels us forward. Is there new information in what business owners are telling us in this data set? relative to what we see in the tax data. That's the premise uh, for everything that we do from this point going forward. So the, there, is, there are two papers actually linkable through today's uh, 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 website. Um, the first is a paper that does nothing more than construct and then explains how we built this, this tax model. Again, that was probably 80% of the work for this project. The, uh, the, the, um, the code is based on a SAS version from Kevin Moore at the Federal Reserve Board. Uh, we re rewrote and extended it in Stata. Everything is going to be available for download. Uh, that was part of our uh, the, the grant uh, funding from uh, Peterson. Was, uh, we made it clear we wanted to make this available to the research community. A lot of the program is focused on splitting households into tax units. Again, that's the fundamental problem. The SCF is a household survey, but taxes are filed on a tax unit basis. So uh, there are 120 million households, 160 million uh, tax units. Uh, and basically, this paper explains how we do that. The uh, paper also talks about how we reconcile income concepts, create and impute income adjustments, itemized deductions, things like that. And the question is, how can we judge whether or not we did a good job with this tax model? Uh, so what we're going to show you is some of the benchmarks. There are more benchmarks in the paper. Uh, we're going to look at the number of returns and incomes relative to published SOI. And I, I will say in advance that there are some known differences, especially the fact that one of the problems with the SCF is that we, uh, the SCF only is, focuses its questions on the, on the respondent and the spouse within the household. There is some information collected about other members of the household. Um, for uh, people who know the SCF well, there's actually more information about people who are in what's called the non-primary economic unit outside the family. And the one group for whom we have the least amount of information would be children of the respondent and spouse who are living in the household, those who would likely show up as dependent filers. So with that, I'll, I'll point out these are the first few benchmarks, basically just showing that over time, the SCF in the blue line is tracking the number of returns published by the SOI in the orange line pretty well. And the numbers are actually getting even a little bit closer uh, over, over time as, as we move from these are SCF years 1995 through 2019. The SCF is every three years. Uh, so we're showing you these, these nine values uh, and they're, they're getting closer over time. When we drill into the type of uh, tax unit, the uh, married filing jointly, separately, head of household and single, uh, we see this point that I made before that most of the gap is in the single returns. And when we look at the counts of returns that are dependent versus non-dependent filers, uh, that gap is basically what we're seeing in the single, uh, single returns. The other categories uh, line up quite well. 
So a lot of this work, again, was going into working with the SCF demographics and, uh, and lining up these data sets. When we look at the amount of income, the ratio of the SCF to, to SOI total income subject to tax, so we have to take out the forms of, of income that are not taxable in the SCF, think about uh, you know, why other forms of uh, income work with the various concepts in the SCF to try and, and, and make them uh, conceptually comparable. Uh, this ratio varies between 110 and 120%. It's reliably over this time, we're always getting a little bit more income in the SCF. So the, the STATA program uh, that, that does this then allows us to, to uh, create the inputs that are fed into the latest version of TaxSim, version 32. Uh, TaxSim has been developed and maintained uh, by Dan Feinberg for many, many years. Uh, it, it, uh, I don't know whether he named it version 32 because it has 32 inputs, but that's the, uh, uh, that, that is the case. And so it's very carefully constructed, for example, to, to do things like the QBI adjustment in recent years. Uh, and Dan actually helped us with a lot of that. I really wanna give a shout out to him. Uh, for helping us get some of these SCF concepts properly mapped into the tax sim concept. So tax sim, when you, you call the file from within, or you call the program from within our state of, uh, code, it returns estimated federal income tax. Uh, I will say up front, we, had, we were trading emails with Dan up until the last minute uh, as we worked on this. Um, the uh, tax sim and uh, the SCF tax and state of program are both a work in progress. Refinements are needed. Uh, part of making these things public available, uh, publicly available is to help us do a better job. But the main outcome, the main takeaway is that, and you would not going to be surprised, we have more income in the SCF. Therefore, when we run it through tax sim, we're going to get more estimated taxes. So this is uh, the black line is, again, uh, published tax amounts from SOI. The red line is our estimated tax amounts by creating this tax file, running it through tax sim. The gap, however, the proportional gap is actually a little bit bigger. And the reason is that the, the SCF, the extra income in the SCF, uh, is not spread equally. It's concentrated at the top of the taxable income distribution. And that shows up here when we do our first distributional comparison. The SCF has too many high income returns and too few negative EGI returns. So go back to what we think is happening with the SCF, where we think that the business incomes that are being reported, we know that they're higher than what's in the SCF, uh, than, than what's higher than what's in the SOI, much closer to the NEPA values. So we're going to see those business incomes are concentrated in, an AG, in the AGI class a million or more. Uh, so the SCF, we have uh, 906,000 returns where the SOI only has 539,000, 68% higher. We know we also have many fewer business losses. We don't have anywhere near the negatives that, um, that you see in the SOI. And therefore, we have fewer many fewer returns in this AGI class of none, uh, which is basically those with losses. Um, so uh, when we look at income subject to tax, same story, most of that income is going to be concentrated above the um, uh, above the $100,000 mark and, uh, and especially the million dollar mark. So how does this tie into what's happening with these aggregates? So I'm going to show you the same graph I showed you before, which is the amount of income in the SCF in the red versus SOI. So the total is those top two lines. That's just a repeat of the chart from before. The bottom line is the gap in the business incomes. And what I want to draw your attention to is the fact that that gap, the gap between the dotted red and the dotted black lines, is roughly the same as the gap between the solid red and the solid black lines. In other words, very shorthand way and with uh, a lot of caveats, most of what is uh, most of the difference between the two data sets comes down to differences in business income. The business incomes are roughly twice what's in the SOI, uh, and the gap is roughly equal to the total gap. The SCF has many fewer business losses than the SOI that would be pulling them down, both pulling down the aggregate amount of business income, and it would be pulling them down through the distribu distribution. So both of these issues uh, are in play. And one of the things I know from working with the SEF many years is that very few respondents look at their tax returns during the survey. And so we're asking a business owner, what did your business earn last year? And, I, and we have a very, I've always had a very strong suspicion that they're telling us that it's what their business really earned. It's not what their business earned after manufactured uh, losses. Uh, so 
this leads us to the to the last part of the presentation, which is the thought experiment, right? So the ability to manipulate these uh, these losses is probably concentrated among the wealthy. But what if we conservatively say all taxable business income is half of what respondents report, and and this gives us these two columns to the right. So this is what we'll call the 50% business income alternative. Same distributional table. This is the number of returns. Um, uh, but here, we're just going to divide all business incomes in half. Assume that every business owner in the SEF reports twice what their accountant reports to the IRS. And we bring these distributions much closer into alignment. When we look at the amount of incomes, it's even more so. And in fact, you can look at the 103% in that bottom right corner. That says that the total amount of income under this 50% business reporting scenario uh, is, is almost equal in 2018 to what we see in the, in the published SOI. And this line shows us that if we run it through tax sim with this 50% business reduction, the dotted line now lies very close to the solid black line, the simulated taxes, the estimated taxes after reducing business incomes by 50% are very close to the aggregate amount. And it's very consistent over time. This is not a one-off thing. Uh, it's not just picking one year that happened to work. Uh, that dotted line lies close to the black line in almost every year. So here's the thought experiment. Assume the 50% business income approximate the SOI. It lines up reasonably well. We could fine tune it, but it, but it comes much closer. We can then think of the unadjusted SEF as an alternative in which we tax all of business income. And then we can look at the impact on estimated taxes by wealth. Uh, so again, the problem is that income by AGI is endogenous to the income concept. Many high wealth business owners in, on the SOI side are gonna have low AGI. That's less true in the SCF. Those high, high wealth business owners also have high incomes because we think they're actually telling us what their true incomes are. Uh, so what we're gonna do is classify the distributional results by wealth instead. So what you're looking at here, the first two columns of this last table, is just the number of households and the share of total wealth. And the only real main takeaway from this is in 2018, uh, the households with $10 million or more in wealth, that's about 1% of households, have about 40% of the wealth. So this is a standard wealth inequality statistic, uh, top tier statistic. It doesn't include a lot of the adjustments that Alice and I and other, other folks have made to try and broaden these concepts. But in general, uh, it's about 40% of wealth owned by the top 1%. So what are the tax liabilities, the average taxes and the share of taxes in this 50% business income, what we think of as the baseline, something that closely approximates what's in the SOI? And the answer is average taxes for families, uh, 208, this is families, we aggregate the tax units back up to the family level, uh, $287,000 uh, for those with $10 million or more, and they account for 27.6% of all tax liability. Uh, if we move to what business owners actually report in the SCF, uh, the number is much higher, right? 367,000 and in the next category down between five and 10 million is also a significant jump and a big jump in the share of taxes paid. So I'm already over time, but let me just uh, try and do uh, real quickly answers to the motivating questions. The, the NIPA versus the SOI analysis shows a really a low and declining share of business income that's effectively subject to tax. And one might say, OK, tell me something I didn't know. We already know that the rich pay less in taxes. This tells us something about how they pay less in taxes. We're really it's not that we're taxing them at low rates. We're really just not capturing their income when we compare it to a NIPA. Right. And some of the gap here is, is compliance, but some is likely conceptual as well. And the policies enacted over the past 20 years have really reinforced this trend. We also think that the SEF has the potential to contribute greatly to our understanding of these missing business incomes. The business income measure is probably closer to an economic concept, and we can tabulate results by wealth. But much remains to be done. Um, so, you know, I would say that expanding the tax analysis to include NIP and SEF data is already promising. But the first thing I think on our, on our long run to do list, the SOI versus the NIPA reconciliation still needs more work. We need to understand, do a better job understanding compliance versus conceptual differences. Factoring in the capital gains, which I went through quickly, needs more thought. Um, and, I, and we really do need to continue developing this SCF plus tax sim capability. Uh, we hope some of you out there will join us in this. And that's why we're making the code available. 
uh, and think about how SVF compares to SOI across more detailed incomes. Uh, one, one thing, for example, for those of you who have access to tax data, we'd be very interested in learning more about joint distributions of different types of income in the tax data. Uh, so if we see a business owner with, with wages being paid to themselves, what does that say about the, the distribution of their, of their business income? Uh, with that, I just want to flash up real quick the supporting materials. Um, I am going to have to uh, shut this down quickly, but if you take a quick look, there are two papers, both accessible through the website that, that you logged on to. Uh, and in addition, uh, we will be making the state of code and the relevant Excel. We did a lot of work with those SOI Excel files, all of that available for download and use. With that, I'm going to say thanks. And with apologies for running over, stop sharing. And Janet, take it away. Okay, do we see my, um, do we see and hear me? Okay. Um, okay, so bear with me because I always screw this up. Um, so, the authors asked some very important questions with very important policy implications. How much revenue are we losing because we don't tax all business income? And who is benefiting? And as I would expect from the authors, they take a very clever approach to this question. They look at the difference between the income reported on tax returns and um, economic income uh, as explicitly reported in NIFA and as perhaps implicitly reported in the SEF. Um, there's another question um, raised by the study that's important to tax and data nerds like me, which is tax data versus other data. Um, I come from the tradition that administrative data like tax data is superior to household data, household survey data, um, and often the comparison is how reliable is the household survey data at reporting income relative to tax data. Um, but they're taking an alternative approach motivated in part by their interest in economic income. But a lot of my comments today will be going back and forth on this dichotomy between tax data and, admit, and the, uh, household survey data. Um, so again, to summarize, two big questions in their study how much business income is not taxed in the United States? And the answer is the same, roughly, whether the authors are comparing the SOI tax data to NIPA at the macro level or to the SEF at the micro level. About half of business income is not taxed, and the untaxed business income is distributed disproportionately to the most wealthy households, which is consistent with what we know about the ownership of uh, privately held businesses in the United States. Uh, the follow-up question though is, okay, you've got two different types of data analysis coming up with two very, with very similar results. Is that validation or is that coincidence? And the second uh, important question and answer that they're getting, question they're getting to is, what causes the gap between taxed and untaxed business income? Now the general answer, which they mention in their papers, is you know it's going to come down to tax laws, avoidance, and non-compliance, whether it's intentional or unintentional. Um, they don't, I mean, empirically, what they find, as John has mentioned, is that losses appear to be a big deal with respect to what's going on between the gap between economic income and uh, what's reported on the tax return. We still don't know though, and this is key in terms of policy, is whether the surge in losses that they find is caused by legitimate interpretations of the tax law, aggressive avoidance strategies, or non-compliance. So first they work with the NIPA um, and they talk, you know, they're using NIPA to obtain economic income, which according to BEA is a comprehensive and consistent measure of income that income earned from current production as then received by the households. It's unaffected by changes in tax law, it's adjusted for non-reported 
and misreported income and excludes items like dividends and net capital gains, et cetera. Uh, when the authors go to the NIPA and to the SOI, for NIPA, they're adding uh, what is defined as proprietor's income in NIPA plus rental income, and then they subtract imputed interest and imputed rent on owner-occupied households. And for the SOI, they're summing up the income report and tax returns from sole practitioners, partnerships, and SCOR, and also adding in rental income. Now, and then as they've said, is that they're showing that less and less of the NIPA business income, the economic income from businesses is taxed over this period, going down to actually about a third when you get to 2018 with the losses becoming a larger proportion of what's going on the NIPA income um, than before. Um, why this is occurring, we don't know from a simple comparison between NIPA and SOI, but we do get some information from BEA because in infamous now table 7.14, they do a reconciliation of the SOI um, business income and what they're reporting as proprietor income. And in fact, they're starting with tax return data. They're taking the total amount reported in the SOI from net profits of non-farm proprietorships and partnerships, then adding in information from another IRS source, and that's the compliance studies that are done every few years, um, and adding in the amount that's either not reported because the person didn't file a tax return or is underreported on their tax return. And then they take another couple steps to align with their accounting definitions, which get them closer to this definition of economic income uh, based on current production. But I wanna emphasize, since it's the area that I know the most about, uh, is that the largest contributor to the distinction between SOI uh, data and the NIPA is this misreporting of income tax, misreporting on income tax returns that that is almost contributing, doubling the amount of business income uh, before you get to the NIPA conceptual uh, changes, accounting changes. Um, and you know, again, in terms of the gap, when they're showing that roughly about half of proprietor's income is not reported to the IRS during this period, that's sort of aligning with what we're observing in the compliance studies with respect to underreporting rates for individual income taxes for items such as non-farm proprietor income, uh, where we see only about half of that income reported. Uh, partnerships and S-Cars, and we'll turn to this in a little bit more detail in a moment, you know, there's a much shorter, a much smaller shortfall. Um, but are the IRS estimates of non-compliance accurate on which the uh, BEA is basing this adjustment to uh, the tax return data. Uh, one is that we don't have information from the IRS on compliance for all years. The decades of the, 19, not, the 1990 decade is a lost decade because of conflicts between the IRS and Congress on whether there should be a compliance study. But even now when there's support for the compliance studies, they lag so we don't have information from 2014 uh, going forward yet. And that raises this particular question because this is a period in time when the IRS enforcement budget has shrunk. Since 2010, it's gone down by 26% in, you know, after adjusting for inflation. And even with a compliance study, you're not picking up all under the, un, not picking up all income. And a particular note, this is a problem perhaps with partnership income. Uh, that we're not detecting all partnership income. Um, the audits are of the individual tax returns. And so to the extent that they are identifying shortfalls in reporting a partnership income is coming from, it's looking at the accuracy of what the partnership is reporting to the individual, how much that is in alignment. But what's missing here is whether the partnership is reporting accurately to the partner. Um, and some estimates would blow up the, would increase the underreporting by 20 billion. Um, there's, 
also an issue of law changes, particularly since um, the last study was done. And one thing that doesn't explain everything, but is an interesting component is the issue with respect to losses. Um, from 2011 onwards, um, there has been a reporting requirement that for certain types of payments that are made with credit cards, um, those credit card payments have to now be reported in 1099s, both to the IRS and to taxpayers. And what a couple studies have found is that since those requirements have gone into place, so those reporting requirements have come into place, we've seen an increase in the reporting by um, um, independent contractors, so props. We've seen an increase in the reporting um, of income, but it's almost been offset by also an increase in the reporting of losses. I don't think that explains everything that the authors are observing with losses, but it's an interesting thing to think about uh, going forward. Uh, so the authors turned to the SEF for more answers. And an important reason to turn to the SEF for more answers is because you gain this information on wealth and are able to do the kinds of distributional analysis. Um, and that's something that's unique to the SEF. Uh, with I'm gonna focus though a lot on the income issues and the measurement of the business income in the SEF. Um, an advantage potentially the SEF is that you're picking up people who don't file income tax returns, either because they're not required to or because they're non-compliant, uh, but really nearly all the self-employed at least are required to file an individual income tax return because of SECA. But the authors make a working assumption and I'm quoting them precisely from the paper, which is SEF business owners are more likely to report what they're business earned, as opposed to what their accountants reported to the IRS. Let's stipulate here that the business owners signed the tax returns that were prepared by their, um, by their accountants. So it's not just what the accountants are reporting to the IRS. But there is this question of, is that working assumption reasonable? Uh, do the taxpayers report what their businesses earn as opposed to what they report in their tax return? Um, and if that's true, that they are, you know, you're asked how much you make for your business and they say, basically say their net profit before all of the ways in which the tax code can manipulate that legitimately or in other forms, then yeah, this is a good way of capturing economic income. And certainly with respect to compliance, you would think that there aren't gonna be the incentives to understate income. You're not getting a tax advantage as you would if you were understating tax income um, on your tax return. Of course, some conspiracy theories may think that all government agencies share information. Um, and that's what I call the big bro theory. But there are other factors that challenge the reliability of the SCF reporting of income relative to tax data. It's a small sample and the survey response is low, especially among the wealthy. Now, the best and the brightest uh, work on the SEF uh, and two of those people are here on the panel. So I'm gonna stipulate that they have taken care of those issues and perfected those. But there then remains the question of, even if you put aside, you know, is the reporting accurate uh, for those who are in the sample? Um, is there an incentive to over-report? You know, you want to impress the surveyor or to under-report, uh, which is it's none of the surveyor's business. As John pointed out, we do know from the SF that there are relatively few, people are told that they can go to documentation when answering these questions. And one of the examples of documentation is tax returns. But very few people actually walk away from the interview and go get that documentation. Uh, but can we infer from that that they're not answering what it was reported on their tax return? The survey occurs, as I understand it, over a period that begins in May and that can extend through the end of the year. In a few cases, perhaps in the end of, you know, 
stumbling into the following year, but the reporting on the income that they earned in the calendar year before the survey year. If you're answering in May, maybe you are just going to answer what you remember that you put on your tax return rather than calculating in your head how much you earned. Um, but by the time you get to December and you're asking questions about what you had earned in the prior calendar year, are you answering based on your tax return? Are you based or are you, you know, responding based on some vague memory that you have for that year or a long time ago? As John also pointed out, there's this issue with respect to the way who's questioned on the SCF. Um, and there's a study that I haven't been able to locate it, but I do recall where it looked at a match between the CEA, excuse me, the CPI and tax return data. And the more distant the relationship between the respondent and the member of the household of whose income they were reporting, there was far less of a match between what was the non-respondent's income in the survey relative to what the respondent, uh, what, relative to what their income was on the tax return. Uh, and then finally, and this happens to me every time I deign to answer a telephone survey, um, people can get tired of the interview. The median length of time of an SEF survey is an hour, but in some cases can go up to as much as three hours. But putting that aside, there is that whole issue of that result in terms of losses that they have found um, in the relationship with the, between the SEF and the SOI. Um, there were many more returns reporting losses on the, in the tax returns than the SEF. And there were a lot more uh, negative incomes in the, S in the tax return data than there were in the SCF. The return data may in fact, the, the counts of returns may in fact be indicative that uh, people are responding perhaps more honestly on their, you know, when they are asked on the SCF. But there's another issue that was raised 11 years ago by um, Barry, An Barry Johnson of the IRS and by Kevin Moore of, uh, of the Fed that indicated that many response respondents when asked about their income would say they had zero income rather than they had negative income. And to the extent to which these are reflecting zero incomes, those two would be contributing to a lower amount of losses than uh, what might be reported accurately on the tax returns. So I have some follow-up questions, two of which are related to policy issues because the data now, the study has been largely empirical, but from a policy side, the two questions I would wanna know is to what extent should we close or narrow that gap between business income measured in economic terms versus when it shows up on tax returns? And how do we achieve that goal? And it's the achievement of that goal, the answer is going to depend on the extent to which this is really being driven by the tax law itself, by aggressive um, avoidance strategies, or by non-compliance. Um, there are a variety of different responses you can have depending on what the answer to that question is. And then getting back to this question of, with respect to these kinds of questions, beyond the wealth issue, which the SEF is superior in all ways, is the NIF or SEF providing better insight into the measurement of income and then the measure of taxes than the IRS data and the tax data? And if I could have my wishes granted, I would start by testing with a match between tax returns and the SEF. There's a lot of matching, those there is, there are work being done. There is work being done for some time now where administrative data are being matched to survey data in order to uh, look at various questions, including accuracy of reporting. Disclosure laws and other kinds of issues may prevent this kind of match, but it would be great um, as a next step forward if they could arrange to have something like that done. And with that, I turn to Alice. Great. Uh, I hope everyone can see um, my, my slides. So thanks 
to um, Bill for in to discuss their paper. Um, standard disclaimer as an employee of the Fed that these are my views uh, and they do not reflect anyone at the board um, uh, or the research staff either. Um, and so I will try to uh, skip quickly over things that maybe were duplicative with Janet's feedback, but I think that we have something a little bit more. So I think that there's a lot of great work and a lot of important issues that the authors are touching upon in the study. And I really struggle with how to think about what to focus on with my 10 to 15 minutes. So the first, um, I'm going to focus on kind of thinking more about business income and losses that we're observing in the tax data from businesses. Um, and with the goal that in the end, businesses more effective, we're seeing what do we know about businesses and their income. Um, we know that businesses are a little bit, these are typically refer to either low visibility items or partial visibility. So when we're talking about the businesses that are showing up, whose income is showing up on individual tax data, we're talking about sole proprietorships, partnerships, and S corporate because they show up in different places on and really blown up in terms of their private, uh, carefully about what that means when we're interpreting Thing for overall uh, aggregate trends. One thing to keep in mind through all, all of this, this is per particularly for partnerships that their uh, profits can flow to a partner's return on multiple lines. So not just an ordinary business uh, Schedule E uh, filing. So and just because we observe a negative for a household or business, it doesn't mean that the many of some of the uh, many SOI Excel files that John referred to earlier, they're still surprisingly to me in some, even though there's some substantially like large number of businesses with deficit in, in their total net income, which is taking the portfolio income into account. So one thing to think about when we're trying to d figure out how to interpret a rise in negative business income is, you know, where are we seeing mismatches between ordinary business income and overall loss? Or is this simply what we would expect if all businesses were uh, behaving in a way that we thought was acceptable, right? So unsurprisingly, we see a mismatch between losses in the finance. And this doesn't surprise me when I think about the types of income that flow to these um, different types. So taking, a, we know, we think more about why are we seeing negative incomes and why is this rising, particularly um, in the expansion over the past 10 years predating the pandemic, right? Capital gains, but I'm going to put the capital gains piece aside for now. Um, and I think one thing that the, um, John kind of looking about the intersection of sort of different types of business income and is it, are they, you know, they realize in capital gains when they have an, a, a bad, um, but so again, to give a little bit more kind of context and pr present the picture of where we are at with it coming out to about 20% of net income. And for schedule, it's showing up on about somewhere between a 25% and one third of individual returns that, um, um, from digging around more in the tax data, these negative net incomes are, are coming from sole proprietorship. So we want to think about why they would be behaving differently than um, partners or S corp owners, right? But again, I think we want to think about what's going on with the uh, negative business incomes that we're observing. Are these big firms or small firms? Are these new firms or old firms? You know, is this some of this simply reflecting kind of business? startups and the churn over the the firm life cycle. Um, and I don't necessarily think that it is, but it, we might want to think that that could be part of uh, what we're observing. Um, so again, we know that the tax code has allow, allows the businesses to take 
uh, a lot of deductions, which is allowing them to maybe be creative in, in reducing their taxable income. Um, but I think that, you know, from outside, you might think that we know that depreciation interest are very two deductions that come to mind when we think about small businesses. But that's these are not huge when you compare them to total business receipts. However, many other provisions in the tax code that on the partnership um, you know, released by the SOI, the other deductions category is quite large relative to receipts. And the the sort of outsized use of these other deductions is concentrated in the information finance and the service professional services sector. Right. So again, we want to think about how we're where are we what's going on in the background that's leading to the data that we're observing. Um, and I know I don't have a ton of time, but I just want to we with creating the um, survey of consumer finances, we do think about the relationship between income and wealth and modeling household wealth from business income is really challenging. So we try to think about when we're, when you observe losses on an individual return, what does that mean for what, what kind of household is that? And it turns out that a lot of households that re reports total report some losses on their um, returns, they're, they're actually quite wealthy households, but maybe that's not surprising. Whereas these are the households that they can afford to take on risky endeavors and they maybe we're observing them when their businesses are getting started and are losing money. That may not be the whole story, right? They might just be really good at getting their taxable income below zero and they're able to build their household wealth at the same time. Um, and again, giant touch along of, on this more, so I won't spend time, but you know, thinking about the creation of the tax system and what, what we want to give preferences to in the tax code versus non-compliance. Um, you know, it, these lead to some big picture thinking about how you would, how do we want to be taxing businesses and what we, what changes might we want to make. Um, and so since I bring a little bit um, specific knowledge about the SCF to the event, I'll spend a little bit of time um, thinking, talking about how might the authors be able to improve their modeling of the, um, the exercise to think about different types of how much more revenue we could gain if we tax businesses differently. And there's a lot going on. And again, some of it, we, we can't know, we're not inside the mind of every student, but as we, there, we, there are observations where you're seeing business owners report a zero, but you know, there's probably some true negative value underlying it. So this might lead to the, some of the losses being underreported. Um, there also could be a little bit of misclassification across income types for or partnerships. The business owner may not know exactly what the breakout is between his dividend or his interest income from a business different from his um, ordinary business income and may give us more in the um, business income line in, in the income section. Um, so just sort of the backstory, and this is kind of also alludes to some of what Janet was saying about, you know, the, the compliance, so this here, the blue line is the SCF business income in the income section. And the orange line is the total from the SOI individual returns. And this is sort of like your starting point. And this is where you would say, well, maybe the SAS not uh, really overstating what um, businesses, uh, their income is, their taxable income is. But if we make, we can make one adjustment to the SOI for the uh, reflecting findings from the audit studies on how much we might think the true economic, true taxable income should be in, to adjust the SOI line. And we can also use what the survey respondents do tell us if if they file a Schedule C or Schedule E or a Schedule F. So this isn't about whether they referred to their tax returns in the response, but whether what schedules they filed with the IRS. So we can adjust for households that tell us they didn't file Schedule E. So maybe they have a rent, they have a one rental property and they you know, don't don't report that income to the IRS, but they would still could they would still tell they could still tell us that they actually do have some um, income from a rental. So that would adjust down the SCF line to the dark blue, and then the under sort of the avoidance part of the uh, from the tax data would uh, adjust up. So you get a lot closer when we're thinking about the role of kind of non-compliance on both the survey and the SOI um, side. 
So I think that there's a, def a number of places where they could make adjustments to how what 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 they're adjusting in the survey. So we might think rental income should be treated differently than ordinary business income, and we could be more you could be more targeted in which households uh, you adjust their business income. I'm going to go a little bit quickly through these because I don't have a lot of time, right? But as we noted, we know that most losses that are reported are small, so maybe. Um, there's you could do something more creative with uh, how to deal with the losses that we do see. Um, but I also think that there's some room that you could use information from the business section where people give details about their actively managed and non actively managed businesses that could help um, maybe also adjust what is in the income section a little bit better. Um, and so the business section is the light blue line here. And that's the total income. And then the dark blue is from the income section, which is what the authors are using. And there's a wedge between the two. And it is expected because, as I noted earlier, partnerships can have many kinds of um, income. And they sh they are reporting to the uh, survey in the business section should give us some of all of their business income sources. And I've done we've done some work with uh, colleagues at the board, Jesse Brooker and Kevin Moore, trying to validate what's in the business section and does it match what um, the, you know the sum of all of the income sources. And it does seem to be reflecting of uh, reflecting that. But so I think that there could be some help where um, maybe the business section could be reflecting economic income more so than the income section. Um, and then I will not run through any of these, <laughs> this, but the idea is that people, uh, households with sole provider income are very different than households with um, pass through or other schedule E income. And the authors talk about this a little bit, but I think that you could do some differential adjusting of what's in the income section to better reflect what we know from compliance studies um, uh, for the different types of income. And the other thing that has been running through the back of my mind is that a lot of business owners may have multiple businesses and they be able, may be able to offset losses in one business with gains in another. And so if you look across the distribution, unsurprisingly, wealthier and higher income households do have more than one business. And that may allow some um, strategic um, income. So I think that... Um, there's so many things to talk about with this paper, but I will just end with it. There's a lot we don't know and we want to know more about. Uh, I think that this paper has done a great job at sort of getting a lot of conversations started. Um, and some of the high level things to think about is entrepreneurship and is, to, is the current approach subject to too much tax abuse, both uh, legal and illegal um, uh, avoidance. Um, and as John said, we know that income is not necessarily a great way to classify households um, in some of it's because people get to choose what they, how they're reporting, um, what they're reporting to the IRS. Anyhow, so thank you so much. Um, this was really uh, um, interesting and I had a lot of fun sort of digging into all the, a lot of the issues that the paper um, brought up. Thank you, Alice. And uh, I assume we are um, moving forward to uh, Q&A session. Um, and I think uh, Bill, once again, he was gonna moderate the Q&A, but uh, has, uh, has ceded responsibility to me uh, uh, because of his internet issues. And I guess I should probably start by saying that, you know, mine and Bill's collaboration goes back many, many years. Uh, and, one, and, and an aspect of our collaboration has always been that I came at it, I come to the questions we like to ask as a measurement person. I'm more focused on inequality and income and wealth measurement. Bill is, is the tax guy. And so a lot of what we were doing was bringing those two things together. Uh, and that's kind of the framework for how I want to answer um, you know, some of, some of what Alice and Janet have raised. These are, these are excellent comments. We, we did a great job picking, picking discussions. Uh, and, and so let me just start with that. And then I'll move over to some of the other questions that I see have come in. And if others come in, I hope someone is going to be, uh, someone is going to be feeding those to me. So let me start. Uh, so one of the, the issues, Janet spent a lot of time talking about NIPA concepts versus SOI concepts. And Alice touched upon this as well. 
Um, and, and, and putting up, for example, this, this table from the NIPA that shows how much they estimate uh, is because of, quote, non-compliance. Um, and I, and I, I, I probably shouldn't tell stories, but I will tell a quick story from uh, the Federal Reserve Board in 2019 when NIPA revisions came out and the amount of proprietor income suddenly jumped several percentage points. Uh, and I was in a room filled with other people who didn't think a lot about NIPA measurement. Uh, and they looked at me and I said, well, that's because they changed the misreporting estimate. And everybody looked at me, what are you talking about? And I said, well, they need the accounts to add up. They need to, to make these things add up. And so I, at that time, that planted in my mind to see that I really don't know how NIPA does these misreporting adjustments. And we need to know more. And I think that, that, that echoes what Janet was saying. I could not agree more that we need to know a lot more about how NIPA is doing these things. And you know, if, if what the compliance studies tell us is that 15 or 20 percent of the gap is, uh, is because of true, true malfeasance misreporting, uh, you know, what's the rest of the gap? And I'm just wondering, you know, how much of the gap on the NIPA side is made in order to make the accounts add up? And I really want to know more about it. So, so I think that I, puts me squarely in Janet's camp in terms of her first set of takeaways and her first set of recommendations. Learn more about what's happening. And part of that involves drilling down into the types of income a lot more carefully. I think I couldn't agree more with that, Janet. And that actually uh, hits uh, upon Alice's first set of points as well. Um, thinking about how much of this is sole props, how much is partnerships and other types of uh, forms, uh, just things that we, you know, we aggregated up so that we could take this first look from a measurement perspective and just answer the question, we have an aggregate economic income on one side, a taxable income on the other, how do the two compare? Um, so that was the first thing I think which, which, uh, which spanned both, both discussions. Uh, moving on to some other things that, that Janet mentioned. So one of the things you, you focused on towards the end was thinking about the losses and how you know we we weren't we still aren't generating a lot of negative returns, right? Where when all we're doing is cutting positive business incomes, we don't see losses, a lot of losses in the SCF. Um, uh, some of them are not disclosed to the public, but Alice, we do actually use the, the disclosure codes to fi figure out that somebody's negative and we put them in that bottom category, even if we don't really know the amount. And we're still way short on the number of returns that have uh, you know, negative, negative income. So we, we, our 50% thought experiment doesn't help us with that. You could imagine a different type of experiment that somebody else could run with the same model, same data, where you say, okay, there's a certain probability that um, certain high uh, income firms uh, generate enough of a loss to completely offset that income. And that would push them down into the bottom, uh, the bottom income group. And in fact, that could be one of your calibrations. That could be a target that you're trying to generate those two million negative returns um, uh, every year instead of the five hundred thousand or so that we actually see. Um, Janet's last point is one that is, uh, you know, it's gonna, it's, it's uh, very well taken. It's one which I have to unfortunately give the the traditional answer. Um, we can't match the SCF to the tax data. Uh, to do so would be to violate. Uh, the agreements under which the uh, the data is collected, and it would violate the uh, you know our our commitment to the respondents who are who are really telling us uh, you know what's happening with their finances, uh, and it's just uh, just something that that we can't imagine uh, doing. Um, you you asked the question you know what is the right income measure, and this is where Bill Gale, as my tax colleague, would would step in and say, well, a tax economist would think of it this way, uh, and and try and get at what is a more appropriate uh, definition of income uh, to a business owner. And you might, for example, say, you know, if, uh, you know, the depreciation schedules are right. And, uh, and so these, it's not as though they're gener generating manufacturing losses. These are true losses. But then I would, I would, I would come back in as the measurement economist and say, wait a minute, you just told me you lost money on an asset that went up in value. Did you lose money? You know, I thought Hague Simon Income told me you made money. So, and, and that's what I'm trying to get at. And what motivated us was to think about um, you know, how is it that we have a lot of people who have a lot of money, they're making a lot of money, they're very wealthy, and they're not paying any tax. And so it's about finding an income concept that's not necessarily, you know, uh, buried in the tax literature that says this is the right way to measure somebody's taxable income. It's really trying to think about something which is, which is broader and get at this general public policy issue. I can't answer your last your last points about how would we tax that income. That's something which I think at this point it's more just about identifying it. 
So Alice, uh, again, thank you. Uh, we, you know, as I said, we, we uh, I think did a great job picking, picking, uh, picking discussions, knowing that you would dive into the, to the SCF. Um, the, the analysis that you did looking at the business module was, is something that's on our, our future to-do list and thinking about what we're really seeing there. Uh, that last chart where you shifted um, the SOI line up based on non-compliance studies, that's one where I guess I'm, I'm a little bit uh, worried about exactly how how one might do that. One of the problems with the SOI, the published SOI data, is that you're seeing net amounts in every category for a tax return. And, and so, you know, it's a net positive or a net negative in this category. But, you know, what we might have is uh, somebody with multiple businesses, as you say, who has a positive in one business, a negative in another, uh, and, it, and it's not going to, it's not going to show up. And so, I guess this would be my appeal for, I know there are, based on some emails I've gotten, there are a few uh, members of the, of the, community, uh, the DC community who have access to tax data, that if, you know, maybe one of the things that comes out of today is that there is a, there's a call, there's a basis here for, for tabulating that tax data in other ways that may help us get at some of this mystery, may help us understand these things. So this is as simple as univariate distributions of these different types of business income. The available tables show us the counts of returns and the net amounts or the total amounts by AGI class. But for example, if we knew something about univariate distributions of business incomes, that would help us uh, evaluate whether, you know, what is the SCF telling us uh, about, for example, proprietor's income? Uh, are we getting that univariate distribution right? And then if we, if we made it to that point, I would then, my next appeal would be for joint distributions, as I men mentioned towards the, the end of the presentation, where we'd say, okay, what is the joint distribution of proprietor's income and say, for example, wage income. And my appeal is not based just on what we're doing here today, but I think about you know, the work on, on labor income and the capital share, uh, Zdarswick and Smith and others who, you know, who are talking about how income, labor income versus other types of income might be shifting within the pass-through world and how that may be impacting. I think that's completely related to the sorts of things we're talking about here. And so, again, I would put down my, compete, my appeal to, um, uh, to, the, uh, to those who do have access to the tax data. I think there's perfectly disclosable things that could be done that would help those of us from the outside looking in and trying to evaluate what's happening in, in other data sets, especially the SCF, uh, to answer those questions. I think that's all I had for the two of you. Um, I think I'm still uh, responsible for answering questions. Let me check my email real quick and see what's coming in. Um, I've got a few here. No additional. Got it. Okay. Let me go back to some that had come in early on and see what I can do with these. So, um, so one question I had, we had, was to what extent does trend to what extent does transfer pricing or international tax planning affect the results? This is where it would be uh, great to have the, uh, the tax economist half of the team uh, up and running. Um, and, um, and I guess my, my, my quick answer would be, I would think of that as, as that mostly being corporate sector issues, less, um, less uh, on the pass-through front. But I guess one could imagine uh, that it would affect things. Again, I, I, I would just pull back to, to you know, the measurement perspective we're taking here. The National Income Product Account says this, the tax data say that, you know, I, it's, that's our opening statement. We want to know what is the difference, what's causing that difference, and this could certainly be, be part of it. Um, another question, effects of TCGAA, um, not just the 199A deduction, but the lower corporate tax rate. Again, this is, this is you know, getting to the question of, you know, what income should we be taxing? And that's, that's a question tax economists debate all the time, right? You think all the time about what is the appropriate amount to tax uh, and how should we tax it? Um, and I, and I guess, uh, you know, I'm, I'm trying to, you know, when we set out thinking about our NIPA benchmark and then the work that we did with the, with the capital gains as well, is it's asking the question, what if we had a, more, a broader concept of what income means? Something, you know, a NIPA type concept uh, to, uh, to, as, our, as our starting point. Uh, any, any implications or inferences about state business taxes from this work? I guess, um, my answer would be it passes through, uh, make a pun here. Uh, so uh, anything at the federal level that's passing through to the state level 
uh, it would seem that, uh, you know, um, it would be, I think we'd have about the same things to say. And how does the size of business factor into the estimates? I don't have a direct answer to that. Uh, I think it's a great question. Alice touched on it a little bit um, when she talked about the SCF and how we have um, very, very different types of businesses in the SCF. You know, we have enough of the of the large businesses uh, and these really uh, these owners, these business owners who are so generous with their time to go through this long, uh, laborious survey. Uh, but we also have a lot of uh, a lot of folks who are um, you know self employed and running a business out of their truck and their basement. And um, you know, my my own belief has always been that um, when we think about non compliance. Uh, some folks like to point to uh, small businesses, mom and pops, and you know people doing uh, service type work, construction type work, as being some of the um, the ones responsible for a lot of non-compliance. And you could see that you're in a mostly cash economy, things like that. And I've always believed that that's true. It's certainly something that's happening. Um, but a lot of the dollars are occurring in the in the in the bigger businesses, the the dollar flows, particularly when we see it from the SEF perspective, and and that's that's part of what motivates me. It goes back to the point that I raised a, a few minutes ago, which is that I don't think it's all just non-compliance. I do think there's something going on with the way that NIPA thinks about business income and how tax economists think about business income versus how a measurement economist such as myself might think about it. So. Um, Nobody is going to interrupt me, it appears. Uh, so I am going to look and see what else Megan gave me. All right, I'll interrupt uh, so you. Go ahead, please. Um, I'm a little bit annoyed at myself because I did want to raise the issue of form of business and how the results could be very different with respect to people getting their income from sole props and people getting their income from partnerships. And that's kind of highlighted in the data we see on non-compliance, where the non-compliance rate is so much higher, at least by the way we measure it now for businesses, for so props than it is for partnerships. So being able to do that kind of delineation in the data, which you can do with the breakdown in the SEF and the breakdown in the SOI data would be a very interesting to observe. And with respect to my comment about my wish list um, of matching the SEF and tax return data, yeah, I don't see that as part of your current study, but for anyone, including you guys in the future, who can get access to uh, tax return data, like, you know, the master file, and, you know, I don't know the disclosure laws, but if SEF could be made available to do that kind of matching, boy, the amount of information that we could gain from that would be helpful. So IRS Treasury folks out there listening, maybe you're doing it. Think about it. And the uh, IRS Treasury folks who signed the member of Memorandum of Understanding with the Federal Reserve Board, uh, I hope you weren't listening. Uh, no, I, I, I don't think there's- No, 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 it would have to- I have my own vision of how this could be done, but uh, I, I uh, Janet, it, I couldn't agree more that yeah. the uh, the ability to to look at what people are telling us. But I guess I would argue, and my response to that would be, I would think there's a lot we can do if folks just tabulated the available tax data differently, right? And in some ways, you know, you you can really get into wormholes with individual, you know, I've seen some of the linkages people have done with census data and tax data, and you can get into linkages where, or get into wormholes where some people seem to be over-reporting, some under-reporting. Uh, you know, there are linkage issues with the, you know, using picks and things like that. Uh, so, you know, I, I would really just love to know if, if, if the story is right, then we'll, it will show up in the univariate business income distribution. You know, that, that we'll see a pattern in the tax data that we don't see in the SEF. But you know, some things will line up, some things won't. And it's the gap between those that, that, uh, that may help us uh, get a better handle on what's really happening uh, with these trends over time. One of the things I think we do see in the data, I, I, I didn't probably say it clearly enough, but I didn't hear it too, too much from either of you. I think Alice might have touched on it. This trend towards business losses and our inability to to tax business income uh, because they're being offset by losses, I, I think is getting a lot worse. Uh, I don't, you know, I think it's something that 
that we need to, to really focus on. Uh, it's not something that seems to be, to be stopping. I have one, if, unless Alice or uh, Jana wants to jump in, I, I will take this other question Megan sent me. Does the analysis account for significant differences in the accounting for employee benefits plans for financial statements versus tax reporting, which is not income to the company? That's a great question from Deborah Beerbaum. Um, again, uh, what I'm what I what we're what we're relying on here, everything is based on published NIPA data and published uh, SOI data. The, um, the one thing I will say is that on the NIPA side, what, there's one adjustment we have to make. I skirted over it because interest of time. In order to make the income concepts comparable, uh, on the NIPA side, personal income, for example, includes uh, the employer contributions to pension plans, and it includes the interest in dividends earned on those pension plans, all imputed back to the household sector. Uh, it does not include, personal income does not include the benefits that are actually paid from, the, um, uh, from, from retirement plans. The income inequality literature, the DINA literature has this exact same problem. And so you can do one of two things. You could either try and make your micro data look like the macro data, or you can do what we did, uh, uh, which is to bring the macro data to the tax data effectively. Because what you do is you don't count uh, the contributions to, uh, to pensions and the interest and dividends, but you do count the, uh, the benefits that are being paid out, both DC and DB benefits as forms of income, because those are the, that's what will actually show up on the tax return. I think Deborah's question is actually a little more subtle because I think she's getting at whether or not um, when uh, a small business pays these, um, pays these benefits or makes these contributions that it may affect tax reporting in a way that I'm not, I'm not seeing immediately. So maybe I, I can just ask her to uh, uh, follow up with me with an email uh, and explain that a little more uh, carefully. Um, I don't see anything else in the queue. We are quickly running out of time. So unless I hear from someone else, I may actually say um, we can wrap it up. And I guess I and I and I just want to say uh, again, uh, you know, thank you to Janet and Alice's uh, great comments. Um, thank you again to the Peterson Foundation for uh, supporting this work. Uh, it's uh, we had a couple we had a couple ideas a year ago, and it's it's been great being able to explore them and build this new tool. And I think hopefully push this this uh, this conversation uh, in a new direction and think about what it really means to. Uh, to tax business incomes. So with that, I will say uh, goodbye. And uh, we're, I'm seeing that uh, we're gonna get muted. And uh, at that point, uh, we will be off the air. Thanks again for everybody to tuning in. Thanks for watching. Be sure to like and subscribe for more videos from Brookings.